Okay. Fulton. Cantu. Barry. Thompson. Thompson. All right, found somebody not here. I've got to find somebody not here each day. <laughs> Howdy. All right, we've been working on columns. <clears throat> we were working on single story structures originally. We knew we had We knew we had multiple story structures available, but if you had single story structures, we had some pretty good pin conditions. It worked nicely. They work nicely theoretically in 305. They have been adjusted to work nicely practically in the tables. <clears throat> Depending on how long they are, effectively, and whether they buckled about the weak or the strong axis, we could design such a column and practiced with several of them. Now in multi-story frames, rather than having a nice pin, which is never nice because you really can't make one and you probably don't even want one, and rather than a nice fix, which you really can't make but you wish you could because it would make the column shorter effectively, <clears throat> these end restrictions, these end restraints are due to the girders that are running across the columns. And what they find is <clears throat> they are supported by the EI over L of the members that are entering the joint. Some of the people want the thing to buckle. They'd like to be pinned in. The column always wants to be pinned, pinned. You have to restrain it and tell it, no, you can't do that if you want it to be other than pinned, pinned. And then the girders also come in. Just a quick review of the table I just discussed. There are your different cases. This is for a frame that is braced. I know it's braced. Uh, in other words, I know it has bracing in it somewhere like that. These are braced because they're all braced by that one. <clears throat> and the tops cannot translate horizontally because the top didn't go horizontally. Stayed directly above the bottom or very close. <clears throat> So this is a braced frame. They call it a side sway inhibited. Here's another braced column because it is or directly above this point. It is side sway, not permitted, inhibited. Here's one where side sway is uninhibited. It's an unbraced column out of a frame that's unbraced. This one is right over that. That's braced, side sway inhibited. Not braced, side sway uninhibited, unbraced, side sway uninhibited. So you'll start seeing some graphs that say this graph is for side sway inhibited frames or side sway uninhibited. Uninhibited means it's uh, unbraced and inhibited means it's braced. <clears throat> we'll get into that shortly. This is the 305 that I taught you. You remember we had a method of solving for our moments in statically indeterminate structures called slope deflection. <clears throat> we did a lot of work to get to that point, but basically we said that if you will go on the structure and stand at point A and look towards point B, the moment caused under your feet is equal to 2EI over L times the amount of rotation of the joint under your feet at A plus the rotation on the other end that you can see down there. You're looking at member AB. And then uh, if there was some delta between the two uh, joints, if one went up with respect to the other one. <clears throat> what I want to remind you is that the difficulty in rotating a joint, which is what we call G, is EI over L. 
In other words, to get a given theta, your choice of what theta is, you tell me what theta is going to be, and I'll multiply it times EI over L, and perhaps some other constants. It's a function of EI over L. The stronger the material is you make it out of, the harder it is to rotate. The bigger the member's moment of inertia is, the harder it is to rotate. The longer the member is, the easier it is to rotate. So if I ever ask you uh, how difficult is it to rotate a uh, joint, then you're going to tell me it's a function of EI over L. Now, let me show you why this is. This is the G that we use. The G that we use <clears throat> is a large number if the columns have anything to say about it because they would like to buckle. The girders are supporting it and they don't like, excuse me, to rotate. And the girders are coming in from the side. They're either small or medium or large. The larger they are, the tougher the joint is to cause it to rotate. And the ratio of those two, these people saying, why don't we roll this uh, thing? And this guy here says, I don't want to roll. I want to just stay horizontal like I was. That ratio will tell you uh, whether or not that particular joint has a tendency to not roll at all, like a fixed end, roll a little bit, like a partially supported end, roll just freely, like a pinned end. <clears throat> then we'll get into those graphs in a minute also. For example, here is a column AB out of a frame. This thing would like to buckle like a pinned pinned and a pinned pinned and a pinned pinned. And uh, if it were braced, then I can keep on just showing these things pretty much directly above each other. There would be a little motion, but not much. If it has no braces in that in there, then probably this one will do something and it'll move over some and it'll move over some and it'll move over some. You'll get, get a different uh, shape of the column when it deflects. <clears throat> now here are your columns. These are the bad guys. These are the guys that it could be aren't even connected very well to the girders. For example, if I have a column that looks like this, and uh, it's connected to a girder at the top with a little old weenie angle and bolted down, then I got a beam, a girder coming in from this side and from this side, and it's just sitting on what they call a seat angle. You've provided no resistance to rotation at all. That's a pure pinned, pinned. You do see how it's pinned, because these support it. They don't let it buckle at that point. They'll let it move. But you're not going to get any resistance to rotation out of these girders, because you need to weld those rascals down. You need to really make it all one piece. If you want these girders... Right now, when this thing buckles like this, the girders say, I didn't even notice you. You know, all you did is you just kind of closed up that gap a little bit. Don't even, didn't know there was a problem. If you'll put this piece up against there and weld it like crazy, and you may have to put some plates in there to transmit that force on across, <clears throat> then when this thing wants to rotate, it'll give it a try. And the minute it tries to roll, this girder right here will say, I don't think so. I don't, I don't want to roll. And therefore, you will support the column against rotation at these points. So first, I need to know all the bad guys. I need you to total up all the people that say, buckle, buckle, let's buckle. Those are the columns. Sum of all of their stiffnesses at the end of the column under consideration. So in this column right here, there's only one column coming into the joint. 
I would need this bad guy's EI over L. Resisting that tendency to roll are two good guys. They say, look, we don't think you ought to just roll. So I'll need to know his EI over L and his EI over L. Without a doubt in this class, E will be the same for everybody, and you probably will just see it drop out. The moment of inertia can very well change, and the lengths can very well change. That could be 20 foot, could be 25 feet, could be 20 feet. So I have two good guys that go in the denominator. I don't know who decided to put the good guys in the denominator and the columns in the numerator. Had they done it upside down, you'd just get an upside down number, and we would be using that for our <coughs> for our number. These are the people who resist rotation of the joint. They're all of the girders. Of all the stiffnesses of the girders coming into the column, coming into that joint for the column you're talking about. So for column AB, for this joint, you'll have two personal bad guys coming in, and you'll have two personal good guys coming in. The bad guys go in the numerator, the good guys go in the denominator, and that ratio is called G for joint A. Then down on B, you have two good guys, you got two bad guys, that would be G sub B. The people that hurt you are in the numerator, they're the columns, People who help you are the beams. Depending on how many come in, that's what you put in. This person has got two people trying to hurt you and make the joint roll. And there's one guy resisting, trying to not let it roll, and making the effective length of these columns shorter, saving you money. <clears throat> so here's an example. I'm looking at this column number two. You'll notice that I needed a massive girder at this floor level. Don't know why. Maybe there were some exceptionally large loads. Even though they were large loads, they could be transmitted through a relatively small column because whereas this one's bent, wow, tough on things. This one's in pure axial, wow, very strong. And therefore, when I go for the E of the bad guy, I of the bad guy, L of the bad guy, plus E of the bad guy, I of the bad guy, L over the bad guy at the top, then I will be putting in the denominator some really massive numbers because the I is much larger. And I don't know about the links. The links will influence that also. Low values are good because, and I'll just show you the table we're going to use. <clears throat> we'll get to it in a minute. This is for a uninhibited frame. It's just what they call a alignment chart. Sidesway is uninhibited. Here are your G's and here are your fix. I'll show you why those are where they are. You'll notice this is K. I would like K to be at least one for an unbraced frame. An unbraced frame is very close to like our unbraced column. You remember what the K was for that to get the true effective length? One, no, good guess. Two, no, but getting closer. 2.1, right. <clears throat> and it is two if you're still in 305 land, but we're no longer in 305 land. We're in real world. 2.1. And so look what happens when G gets lower. What do we say here? Uh, low values are good. If G for joint A is this number and G for joint B is this number, there's your K right there. If you say, wait a minute, I calculated that wrong. G A is this and GB is that, then you no longer get a 1.5, you got to take a 2.9. That means 2.9 times the length of the column, its true length. 
So obviously, the more you can lower these G's really effectively, uh, you know, without cheating and still be safe, you come out way ahead. <clears throat> Here's one that I showed you before. The G's coming in from the side of this one would be zero, and therefore you have all bad guys and no good guys, so the G will be infinite. And they got a they got an infinite on there. There's an infinite. There's an infinite. Uh, it's very possible. I don't know. You'd have to look a little further. No, I think that's it. That's the only that's the only two beams we have coming in. They're both they're both pinned. Here's your G bottom. The equation says, tell me the EI over L for the bad guy coming into the joint. Tell me the EI over L for column number seven coming into the joint. <clears throat> Here are the people that are supporting things. But it's a really weeny beam even compared to the column. So these numbers are going to be very low. Since these are high and these are low, you're going to have some pretty large G's, and those are bad for money. Gamble? Gamble? How hard is it to roll a joint? Wait, wait a minute. Maybe I ought to, maybe I ought to rephrase that. How, far, how hard is it to rotate a joint? Okay, yeah. Didn't want anybody to get the wrong idea there. More of them? That's practically fixed, fixed. And by almost being fixed, fixed, you're going to get to use a 0.5? No, what? 0.6 or 0.65? I don't remember. But you're right, not 0.5. Not in the practical world. And you're going to have to have some really stiff girders coming in to force that thing to buckle like that. Here's one where I haven't really showed you any sizes. If they're weenie girders, it's just like a pen. You get just like a pen, pen column. If you make these girder bigger, they're harder to rotate, so the column buckles like this, where the effective length goes from 16, maybe down to 14 feet. If you put some massive girders on there, then this thing will come kind of like this and have the pins here and here. So up to when you make this length point, what was it, point 0.6 or point 0.65? Point 0.65 of the original length. That's about the best you could do. <clears throat> Same example. K is 1. K is point 0.8. K is point, there it was right there, point 0.65. These are the bad guys. They want to buckle. They want to do this. They want to be pin pin. That's that's their goal in life. Yes, sir. No, no, no. The L is the true length, the true length of the girder, and the true length of the column. Because <clears throat> if you did that, you'd have a problem. In other words, because you would be entering with the true length and finding out the effective length was eight tenths. Then you have to go back and say, well, what if the effective length was 8 tenths? Well, then it would drop down to 0 0.7, something like that. So they're using the true lengths in these things. Good guys, bad guys. So I've got an example. Uh, let me, before I get into the example, let's go back to these pages where the graphs show up. Or the nomograph shows up. First, this is out of the reference, uh, the specifications. Here's what he's asking you to calculate. He doesn't really tell you, but one's at the top and one's at the bottom. You're going to get one for the top. You're going to get one for the bottom. Or put them in bottom, top, doesn't make any difference. You get the same answer. <clears throat> This is only if the bra uh, frame is braced. You see how the top A is uh, right pretty much above point B? So somebody put some braces in there enough to brace the entire frame. 
You'll notice this is in the commentary. If you work out your EA, EI over L sum for the columns over the sum of the EI over L for the girders, you're going to get just a number. In this case, this particular person who drew that line has got tiny columns, little weenies, and the girders are beasts, so that's no rotation, practically fixed. And uh, K for that is 0.5, or 0.65 practically. Uh, well, I don't know that because you depend on the other end too. That's just G for the bottom. If you have tiny columns, you have bad guys over good guys. Bad guys are, they have no say-so in the matter. They're just too flimsy. And therefore, the girders control, and you'd have up to zero. The other end of this column, column A, on the other hand, they have monstrous columns up there. And they just make up your mind. Beast columns, tiny columns. Beast columns, tiny girders. G-I-R-D-E-R-S. That means this will be a big number. And these people will just say, we can't resist. So they will have low numbers. That's just like it was pinned or close to it. Therefore, large over nothing is like 50 or 60 or infinity. The way you find the K for a fixed pinned column by girders is you put the GA on one joint, the GB on the other joint, you draw a line, lo and behold, 0.7. You will only use the K-factor table in cases where you like have a single frame, single story frame. Then those are very appropriate. All right, now you got to remember that these charts are based on the assumptions that people made when they derived them. One of them is this, that everything in here is elastic, that there are none of the columns have gone into the plastic range. Talk more about that in a minute. The second nomograph is for an unbraced frame. Notice that the upper joint is displaced with respect to the lower joint, a reasonable amount, an inch or so. See no braces in there. Again, elastic behavior of the columns only. They are also called unbraced frames or side sway uninhibited is what they call it. And then you go get the same thing. You get the G of the top and the G of the bottom and you enter the numbers. And for instance, if you had a 1 for, for one end, and if you had a 10 for the other end, then you just come through here and you pick out the K value. And, of course, those are done mathematically. Somebody went in and said, okay, how strong is this column if it rotates so many degrees at the top and so many degrees at the bottom? And how would that happen? Well, there'd be a, a ratio of the people coming in wanting to buckle and these people not wanting to buckle, and they plot all the numbers and they give you a graph for it. No, sir, this is for any frame where the side sway is allowed to occur. You get the, uh, the G for the, you get the, de the numerator of the G for the columns. You get the denominator for the G for the girders, and you enter that number. Then you do the same thing at the bottom, and you get that number. Then having those two numbers, you draw a straight line across. It tells you the effective length of the column. So, uh, let me see, you had a, got a, there's several practical things that he wants you to take into account. We can't take them all into account, you know, there's 50 of them. But the most important ones, most of them, if you don't take them into account, you're on the safe side. But, so that's what he says in the text we're going to do, because it's just impossible to do them 
all and still get into welds or anything else. But he says, I want you to note that for columns supported by but not rigidly connected to a footing or a foundation, theoretically it's a pin, and G therefore is theoretically infinite. infinite. Reason being is the girders come, the columns coming in want a buckle. They'd say, we're rolling this uh, joint down here. And you say, well, let me see if I can resist. No, it's a pin. That would be something over nothing. That would be a G of infinity. Truth is, they're not that bad. And they have found a long experience and a lot of testing and a lot of money that if you, unless you really put a pin down there, I mean, you say, look, I drilled a hole in it, I put a bearing, and I greased the bearing monthly. Well, that's a real pin. You better use infinity for that design. But if you just stick it on a column and bolt it down, they found that you can use a 10 for practical designs. So, <clears throat> now let's see, that is for uh, side sway inhibited. See, this is the tail end of the previous page. So in this one here, instead of using zero like you and I did for this one, uh, you can use a G, where is this? I'm sorry, instead of using an infinity like we did on this one, you can drop it to a 10. It comes under the sections. I don't think I have the previous page. I don't, but it, it doesn't matter. That's, this is the one it works with. Second thing he says is, if it's rigidly attached to a properly designed footing, then you may think that it is uh, uh, not able to rotate. But he says, in truth, he says, I'm willing to give you something you got coming to you I found by test. He says, but just because you rigidly attach it to a big old thick plate and bolt it to a properly designed footing, it's still got some rolling to it. I don't want you to go down to zero. I want you to use a one. He says, if you show me some kind of calculation where it's just got to be zero, then that's okay. You can do it. And then they got a bunch of other things. I don't have the page on them, but we omit everything. The only other thing we do admit, omit, or we do include, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, it was mentioned earlier. We said that the columns acted elastically. Interestingly, a lot of the columns don't act elastically. They're already well towards plastic behavior uh, before they even get ready to buckle. So here's an example. Got a rigid frame shown in this figure. He has written down what kind of columns and girders are coming into the joints. He is studying this column right here. Here are two bad guys coming in at the top. Here are two good guys trying to support it. They have different lengths. They have different moments of inertia. I went and tore, uh, got the uh, moments of inertia for 12 by 96, 120. There's 833, 1070, 1350, and 1080. And I told you what page they're on. Also have different lengths. Here's the G at the top. The column is a 12 by 96. It has a 833 divided by L. His L was 12 feet divided by 12. There's another column coming in under the bottom into that joint. It's a W12 by 120. So you add 1070. And it is also 12 feet long. You divide it by the people that are trying to stop this column from buckling. The moment of inertia of the 24 by 55, 1350 divided by its length. And the 24 by 68 divided by its length. That gives you a 0.94. This is a braced or an unbraced frame. Unbraced frame. 
go. So let's just see. G sub A. Here's G sub A. Either end is fine. We got a point nine four. Everybody happy here? Ooh, how, how did you know that? Because it says its side sway is inhibited. This is braced. The other guy said, well, I didn't notice the words, but I noticed these two points are right above each other. That's not an unbraced frame. You're using the wrong nomograph. Not a problem. I got another one. G sub A is point ninety four. Point ninety four. There's that probably there it is right there. Point ninety four. On the other end, there are two twelve by one twenties coming in. That's why you see these two numbers are the same. There's I sub G, here's our girders. Uh, why has he only got one number written down here? There's two of them coming in. Thoughts on the subject? Only got one. That's right. In other words, what's coming here is a 24 by 55. <coughs> what's coming in here is a 24 by 68. He says, hey, man, I already worked the number out. That's it right there. The point 0.95. Come over, you can see the difference between the 9.4 and the 9.5 there. Got really good eyes. And I say, well, I don't like this. I don't think I'm getting enough accuracy. You're getting plenty of accuracy. There's plenty of more inaccuracies that are a lot worse than these. However, uh, they do give you the equation for these. I guess I didn't, I didn't have that page. They give you the equations. There they are. They give you on page 16.1511, they give you the equations. And I think I mentioned EES. Did I mention that is available to you? I did. That's what I did when I said, well, I'm not getting enough accuracy. You want to know what K is? You simply type in EES, this equation. Put your G sub A there. Put your G sub B there. Tell him up at the top and then give him this equation right here and he'll solve for K. And he'll tell you the right answer. Uh, the right answer is 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. The right answer is 1.3026411. Perfect. I love it. Uh, the answer is 1.3. Plenty close. Nobody's, nothing's ever going to fail because you didn't get that thing picked off there perfectly, believe me. So there's an example. What did he get? Uh, he got a 1.3. Well, that's where, uh, I, without a doubt in the world, I took his number. No, no, that's calculated. That's calculated. When I drew it on a graph, it looked like it came out pretty close to 1.3. Uh, in a long frame like that, you won't be able to just put one brace and have them all be held down. You know, some reasonable distance, you're going to have to put another set of braces because after a while, just slack and slop and things in the joint is going to make these, uh, make these not really brace. So they'll have you put more braces. These are typical braces. These are more efficient than these are. Um, yeah. yeah so. You would think, and you would think, yeah, I would think. However, you'll get that when you run it in the computer program, and the computer program says that lateral load is coming down there, it's pushing horizontally on this column, and then you will have to design this column not as a just a plain old column out in space, but one that has a horizontal load on it. And when you design it, you'll find out, ooh, that kind of hurt my column. And the guy said, well, I don't know, because it sure did help our windows. 
And I say, well, I guess we got a question here. How much are you willing to pay for that window? He says, well, I don't know. How big are these windows? I said, well, they're right down here on the floor. <laughs> he says, okay, as an architect, how much more money? I say, well, about a quarter million. He says, that's not that bad on a $200 million building, so do it. It's his call. All we do is we make sure it doesn't fall down. Oh, they've got to be much, much greater, no question about it, because they do have lateral loads on them. You'll see when you right now, you and I are designing columns without that, we will get into designing. Now then it's going to be called a beam column because it has beam loads and column loads. When we get designing into them, it's more challenging, and the beam has to be much bigger. All right, one condition usually not satisfied, I'm on our Segui page 150, is that if the slenderness ratio is less than the break point, what is this break point for 50 KSI steel? 113, that's right. If it's less than that, you're down definitely in the inelastic range, and some of your fibers are going inelastic. And it turns out that if you don't take that into account, you're missing a good bet. And I'll show you why. Uh, let me come back to the design or that equation in a minute. Here we go. <clears throat> Here are three columns. First, we have a small column with, I guess we have the same column have 600 kips of load on it. When you put 600 kips of load on it, that's such a weeny column, you don't really get much load on it. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's why you only get 600 kips of load on it. At 600 kips of load, you cause a uniform stress, piece of view over area gross. And this is the yield point uh, when the column does tend to buckle it is connected nicely. It's welded on there. The column has all this capacity to tell the girder, I think we ought to roll. In other words, he puts a moment on the, on the girder that really is hard on the girder. It really does want to rotate the girder. And the girder strains not to let it roll, but probably some rolling exists. In this case, I have a shorter column. I don't know how much shorter, but it buckled at 900 kips. At 900 kips on this particular column, uh, incidentally, this column, when they tested it, uh, SWA critical was 600, and it buckled at 600. This one, when they said it would go to 900, it really went to 1,000, and that's when this whole thing came up. How come this is off? Well, it's not off that bad. But what happened was, is when you put the 900 on there, your load over area has already used up a lot of the available stress in the fibers. And instead of having a lot of stress left over to talk to the girder, now then the stress you got available, so you already used up half of the yield. So you have this little area times its moment arm times its area and this one. You have some moment to discuss with the girder the rolling situation. But not nearly as much as this one. Man, the girder knows this guy's here. The girder says, well, I don't know, let's negotiate. When, on the other hand, you shorten it up so that you can uh, supposedly put 1,600 kips on it, you put 1,600 kips on it, you test it, it's way off. You really can put 2,200 kips on it. The guy says, why is that? Here's what happened. When you put the 1,600 kips on it, you darn near yielded the thing just with the 1,600 kips. And then it t started to buckle. It started to roll. Once it started to roll, it could t talk to the girder with this little bit of added stress. See how that stress times area times moment arm has a little talk, a little, little moment to it? You know, maybe... 20 foot-pounds on the bottom of the girder. And the girder said, <laughs> you must be kidding. I'm not rolling. Here we put 50 kip feet on the girder. 
Here we put 10 kip feet on the bottom of the girder. Here we put a kip foot on the bottom of the girder. So what happens is, is this bad guy who wants to roll has far less say in the matter once these stresses get in the inelastic range. And that's what they're trying to correct for. That's why we got a thing called tau sub b. Here's a more step-by-step -step thing of what happens is you put load on it. If you put load on it, you get some stress. And if it buckles at that stage, here is your, your uh, excess moment that you can try and roll the girder with. Whereas if you, uh, you already used up a lot of the stress because you're over in this region, then all you got left is these little elastic things. The truth is, if you keep on rolling, you know, those fibers will go plastic till they all go plastic. So there's a little more than just the, the linear part. But still, this has far less influence on the girders, uh, forcing the girder to roll at that joint than this one. The, this one has far more effort, more, far more effectiveness than this one does. So we get what we call a stiffness reduction factor. It's listed on page 4-31. They list it as tau sub b. Now where they get this tau sub b from is our page 151 in Segui. Uh he says, do you agree that F critical is pi squared E tangential divided by KL over R squared? I say, well, I thought that was just E. He says, no, no, you agreed with me that if this thing didn't have just a beautifully defined uh, yield point, then when you got the loads up in here, you had a tangential modulus elasticity you're supposed to be using. I said, well, that's, that's true. But I thought these things were all elastic. Uh, he says, no, no, you just, you just proved to me they're not all elastic. We were just pretending the columns were elastic when we got those G values before. I said, well, okay, I guess you're right. He says, your real G that you should have written down. The girders are elastic all the time in their effort not to roll. But the columns, on the other hand, you really shouldn't have put E. You should have put E tangential. So it says the G you should have been written, writing down and entering into the table is not really an elastic G, it's an inelastic G. And the inelastic G has, all of these numbers are unchanged. I column may not be the same as I girder, but you know the only change you made in that formula was E over E. You changed it to E tangential over E. So if you got a G elastic, you really ought to be multiplying it by E tangent over E. Which means, divide this stuff out, that says F critical inelastic is to F critical elastic. This is a ratio of just with the tangential as opposed to the regular E. And the same idea, the only change made was the E. That's what we're going to call tau sub B. Now past this point, the derivation kind of goes downhill. The reason being is about two pages of work was done by Galambos in 1998. If you go look it up, then you can see he does show that F critical elastic can be uh, represented by this, elastic with this, where lambda is that. But without seeing it, there's not much reason to plow through all the rest of it. Let's just say basically a lot of people have been through the work that Galambos did back then, and it's correct. I have no reason, well, I've been through it too, there's no reason to suspect otherwise. He's trying to get this ratio for tau into an equation form. He says, I'm going to give you a table, but a lot of times people really want to use it in equation form, and this is what the, the only thing the equation is for, is to get you an equation for tau. What you do is it's four times the nominal load divided by the yield load, one minus. And in terms that everybody agrees on, anytime you see an alpha, it's a one. 
The alpha is always there in the equations to accommodate the allowed stress people. They, they are still not really doing it the way we're doing it. They get a little different answers. But it's sometimes where you need some factor that basically really is entirely dependent on plastic action, then they're going to have to be brought kicking and screaming into our world. But if you see an alpha, we're already in our world. For LRFD, it's a one. For ASD, they're basically adjusting their loads to bring them into the plastic range so that they can use the same equation we use. Our equation is just this one. Our uh, piece of use, the ultimate request, that's what you're going to try and get your nominal load up to uh, over piece of Y. Fees involve the whole thing. This is our tau sub B equation. Then he's got an example where all he asks you is what's tau sub B if you know uh, the P sub U and the F sub Y and that stuff. Here's the table. For the different steels, unless you're going to use the equation, for a 50 KSI steel, all you have to do is you tell me the piece of you request, and you tell me the gross area of the column that you're planning on using. You tell me the stress caused. Let's say the stress is 30. Then I'll tell you that that column has been hurt so bad that 4% of its strength, 4% of its ability to talk to a girder has been lost. That's good for you. Let's say that you ran the stress up to 40 KSI in a 50 KSI steel. It's lost, what, 36% of its ability to force the girder to roll? All you do is you take your G's and you multiply them times this number right here. Goes up to about 45 KSI out of 50, in which case your G's should be reduced to 0.36 of their values. Uh, before or after you're finding K, well, no, that's before you're finding K. No, you got the G, you got the G, you pick up the, the, the nomograph, and the guy says, did you take into account that column is yielding? Uh, I say, oh, no, I haven't done that yet. So what you do then is you uh, apply this factor to the Gs. That'll give you a new K, and that'll tell you how strong the column you proposed is. So you know piece of you that came from the load people. You know the gross area because you have selected an initial thing. You say, I hope the devil a W12 by 50 is going to work. And if it, and now you're trying to find out if it works. Now the only time that you don't actually do that are the two practical cases that they have. If you ever have a real fixed column where they have insisted that you use g is equal to one instead of zero, or if you were permitted to bring this g for a pin column from infinite down to ten. Those do not get multiplied by these tau factors. They're the only ones that, that's already included in here. And he's got another example. Incidentally, this is the frame. Got 12 by 14s across here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 bays. This is really what the structure looks like. The solid one is the front face. Those are the ones in back. What happened was the main loads were coming from this end. The guy wanted the open windows. He wanted windows everywhere. I said, can't do it. If you want me to, I can orient these columns such that the flange is on the left, the flange is on the right, the web's like that, and when you push on it, it will not fall down because these are welded at these joints. However, when you push on it this way, that's going to bend it about the minor axis. You just don't have much choice but to go ahead and put braces in there. Because bending this thing about its minor axis is going to provide very little, if any, strength, and therefore the whole thing is going to fall down. 
So you got to situate your column, strong axis, weak axis, your choice. But strong axis, you don't need the bracing. You can live without them. It would be cheaper if you put them. But about the weak axis, there's just not much else you can do but put braces. And that's what's assumed. All right, we'll start there.